Oh, we're live. Hello, everybody. This is Joanne Manister, a science goddess from Twitter. And we are here again, once again, Read Science with my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, and with our guest, Dan Egan, who is the author of uh, two books I have loved. Um, I sort of became obsessed with uh, Dan Egan's writing after reading The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. I am a Midwesterner, not quite on the Great Lakes, but been there many times. And his newest book is The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and the World Out of Balance. And wow, it's very reflective. Anyway, uh, Dan, great to have you here. Great to be here. Uh, so let me go ahead and read your bio here. And um, so Dan Egan is the Brico Fund Journalist in Residence at the Center for Water Policy in the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. Dan is an environmental journalist and author of The Death and Life of the Great Lakes, and he was a reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, covering the Great Lakes from 2002 until 2021. He has twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and has won many awards, so I'm not going to read them all. And Egan, Dan Egan is a graduate of the University of Michigan and Columbia School of Journalism. And I won't read the rest, but the rest does talk about your time in the west side of the United States doing some environmental reporting out there. So welcome. Yeah. yeah. Do you want me to talk about being I, You know what? Why not? Let's okay, go ahead. ahead. I, I'm very curious because I was like, oh, are you, were you a originally a biologist? No, or? no. I, I was a history major and uh, not a real focused one. And so it was kind of the path of least resistance at the time. And I had a vague interest in journalism, and uh, an uncle of mine suggested that I get a job at a small newspaper somewhere rather than trying to go to journalism school. He said, you'll, you'll figure out if you like it and can do it real quickly, and you won't have to pay tuition. So I ended up um, out in Ketchum, Idaho, which, was, which is also Sun Valley. So it was a really you know, kind of nice place to get an entry-level job. I didn't know at the time, though, that I was going to be thrown into all these hot button environmental issues <laughs> because of the location and the time that I was there. Uh, there was grizzly bear recoveries, uh, wolf reintroduction, and then the uh, Snake River sockeye salmon saga, which continues to this day. Yeah, I worked there for a few years, two years, and then I went to Idaho Falls on the eastern part of the state, which is not far at all from Yellowstone. And uh, I did have a brief detour into Yellowstone before my first newspaper job. I worked there for a little bit with the park historian. So then I covered more and more environmental issues. And then I went to Salt Lake City. And um, finally, after about a decade being out there, made my way back to Milwaukee, not as an environment reporter, as a feature writer. But when I, you know, arrived back in Milwaukee in my home state and saw Lake Michigan, I just saw it with a whole new set of eyes because I'd basically been in a desert for a decade. So that launched me on the on the beat that occupied my life for 20 years. Oh. Do you feel like an environmental reporter now? No, no, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I feel like a reporter. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm not working at a newspaper, daily newspaper anymore, I always felt that. And I, I kind of felt a little bit like a fraud in that people assumed that I had, you know, an environmental history, mm -hmm. uh, you know, education history, or I was a big outdoorsman. And I mean, I, I, I don't fish. <laughs> I, I love the water. I grew up on it. And I, I boat and swim and just mostly, you know, it's such a beast of a lake. I'm looking over there here because I can see it out my window. Um, nice. I mostly just soak it in. But I've, I've long said that, you know, if it was county government or if I was covering the Green Bay Packers, I would have done it the same way and probably would have gone down the same rabbit hole with whatever topic I was covering. Okay. But I was lucky enough to do this for 20 years, which was really, yeah. you know, not I've, common anymore. I thought of my first big topic, I think. Uh, one, one is to say that I was surprised when I started reading the book. I was very drawn in. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of the good journalistic reporting, which was very convincing without being dull, uh, but also I liked the way you worked from the discovery of phosphorus to 
things that are happening now and that that storyline um, kept being renewing interest until we got sort of to what seemed like uh, you were going after. And I really enjoyed it. Therefore, I'm not going to start there. I want to plop down in the middle of things. Okay. <laughs> because I was reading and finally got to the point where I am old enough, believe it or not, <laughs> that I can remember uh, when the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught on fire. Mm-hmm. And I can remember seeing advertisements on TV about exciting new wonderful laundry detergents now phosphorus free <laughs> yeah. and i could see that suddenly being phosphorus free was something they thought was a really big marketing deal and i had no idea until last week when i finished your book why it was a big deal yeah so you know what does the cuyahoga river have to do with being phosphorus free tied and what's that got to do with what we're talking about? And then I thought perhaps we could work our way through the other things uh, from this intro perspective. Yeah, you know, that string, that plot line, if that's what it is, that was a challenge to kind of mm-hmm. string that together because I really approached this from a, from a water perspective, from what, what phosphorus was doing to waters, but I needed to, to back up and, you know, orient the reader at the beginning, I thought. But here but, we are. I'll jump into the middle and talk yeah. about Phosphorus, but, and, but that did mean including a lot of really interesting reporting and science and history along the way. And I think that's all part of the statement. It, it made it all very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I saw it as just really linking together. I, I don't know how many chapters there are, nine, I think. Nine, nine, nine stories and, and finding the thread. But we'll start, we'll get to, I don't know what chapter this was, maybe chapter four. But it really is the part in the book where I pivot and start talking about not the hunt for phosphorus Mm -hmm. and, you know, the craving that we have because it provides the chemical fertilizer that sustained the 8 billion of us, soon to be 9 billion. Um, So that's that's one aspect of it. But but phosphorus, you know, is everywhere in the environment. And it, it wasn't really a problem until the 1950s or 60s when we started using commonly started using washing machines after World War II and we stopped building bombs and planes and tanks and started building fridges and washing machines and such. And it turned out that those machines worked great, but they needed a more potent soap. So uh, the researchers at the time concocted detergent. And when I I first started learning about all this, I thought detergent and soap were synonymous. Mm -mm. I now know that there's a difference between a skateboard and a a rocket. Um, <laughs> and, and it turned out that one, a big component of this synthetic soap, this detergent, is phosphorus. And, and why? It's kind of complicated, but it basically is a, is a water softener. So for areas served mm-hmm. by hard water, it would keep washing machines from getting all gunked up. Um, so it was a convenience for, for the industry and for the people and I'll say women, because it was almost always, as far as I could see from my research, it was this detergent was always marketed Mm -hmm. for uh, women. Here's a little aside that I'm just wondering if you noticed, as I mentioned this, I have a line in the, in the, I've only heard from one person who recognized what I was doing. I have a line in the book talking about women stuck in the basement uh, with all their children and the days of their lives and another world. I I make all these soap references. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) Well, yeah, because I, I thought I might have been being too cute, and, but then. You know, it <laughs> so it wasn't so blatantly obvious that people went, oh, he's referring to soap operas. <laughs> and they were called soap operas because they were peddling detergent. Yes. And they were peddling them to, you know, it was largely um, females <laughs> at the time. I can, I can personally attest that that is no longer the case. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so so the, the cost of making this this drudgery much more convenient um, was was really uh, borne by our, our fresh waters because phosphorus, as I mentioned briefly earlier, it, it's a critical nutrient. It sustains modern ag- agriculture. It makes things grow miraculously. It's some of the miracle and miracle grow probably. I haven't looked at the actual <laughs> ingredients, but. Um, it doesn't lose its ability to make things grow when it washes off the landscape and into fresh water. 
And so that's why you're talking about the Cuyahoga River and more specifically than just the river burning. That was really the result of a bunch of industrial accidents. Mm-hmm. Just, but phosphorus was a big problem there, but it was a, it was a huge problem on the Western basin of Lake Erie and well, all of Lake Erie, they were calling it America's dead sea in yeah. the late 1960s. And yeah. Dr. Seuss in the Lorax, actually, I think he wrote that in 71 or 72. He takes a crack at Lake Erie and, you know, he's trying to find a, a, a rhyme to sh- the water is schmeary. You know, I don't know. <laughs> He, I mean, it had it, 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 um, so saturated popular culture at the time, the idea that we were, you know, trashing our lakes that it even ended up in children's books. And so, so people collectively decided at this time that, you know, uh, dead seas are too high, so high of a price to pay for, for whiter whites and brighter mm-hmm. whites. Mm-hmm. So the first thing that needed to happen was the, people needed to be convinced that phosphorus was the problem. And the detergent industry at the time wasn't interested in seeing phosphorus fingered as the culprit. Mm-hmm. And they were saying, Oh, it could be any other, you know, <laughs> it could be nitrogen. It could be carbon. It could be anything. <clears throat> and so this is, this is, there were so many of these little stories that I fold into the book that just, yes. I talked about rabbit holes earlier. I went down a rabbit hole and I, I came out in far Northwestern uh, Ontario in an area called the experimental lakes area yes creatively and yes. so so that's relevant to this story because what happened in the 1960s and early 70s is a bunch of researchers were basically given carte blanche to go up into the wilderness and treat a bunch of these lakes like oversized test tubes to find out what was what was following america's waters and one of the most famous experiments they did was they took a peanut shaped lake so it had like two lobes and they cut it in half with a polyurethane curtain. So they basically turned one lake into two lakes, and they were reasonably confident that they had the same water chemistry because it, they were, it was the same lake. Mm-hmm. And then they added, uh, in simple terms, they added phosphorus on one side and nitrogen on the other. And they had already done other experiments ruling out carbon inputs as the source. And so uh, about two weeks later, they went up in a helicopter and they took a picture, and the side that got phosphorus was green as Augusta. <laughs> and, and the side that didn't was was the deep blue of a canadian lake that you yeah and that picture was worth a thousand ordinances and laws and whatnot it just it at least a, yeah it was a very dramatic story yeah and and and, and it led to a very dramatic recovery of mm-hmm. lake Erie and waters across mm-hmm. the country they they basically well i mean the industry worked with them once the writing was on the wall but if it wasn't banned in certain municipalities, it would, the, the companies making detergent uh, greatly reduced the amount in their in their boxes of detergent, and the result was just miraculous. In 1972, it was it being Lake Erie was still considered dead sea, and the reason it's a dead sea is because it's not dead. It's because so much algae was growing in the lake that it squeezed out life for everything else. Particularly, mm-hmm. when it died and decomposed and burned up all the oxygen in the water. It really left not a lot of room for other forms of life. So 72, it's America's Dead Sea. By 85, uh, I think this was in the Great Lakes book, not this phosphorus book, but Dr. Seuss received a letter from some researchers at Ohio State that said, who said that, um, you know, this line in the Lorax isn't fair anymore. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're yeah, yeah. We've, we've straightened up, we've cleaned yeah, up. We, yeah, we got more fishing <laughs> lines than punch lines finally. And, um, <laughs> And you should note that, and, and the good doctor, he's since deceased, he wrote back and said, you're right, and he pulled it from the Lorax. So if you go down to the bookstore today and try to or pick up a copy, you'll see no reference to Lake Erie being, you know, a mess. But yeah. <laughs> it probably should be back because we're back in the same fix. Yeah. In the yeah. 60s yeah. And 70s. You Which, know, what I, I found interesting with your, your book is like, uh, I mean, and journalists do this very well. So they put a <clears throat> personal story the guy who picked up phosphorus along mm. the shore and you know burns him pretty well and then you know the um the story of the the kid who falls into the river <laughs> or lake with the foaming yeah. soap and you know the story in the newspaper is not look at all this foaming bubbles <laughs> you know yeah, it's, yeah oh where's the kid yeah just yeah yeah people were doing their dishes so at the time yeah this this detergent concoction not only turned waters green but it turned their surface bubbly and um yeah you know that was just considered normal by the 1960s and uh 
Okay. And so, so anyway, uh, but we are back at Lake Erie again and, and out mm -hmm. freshwater lakes around the country and the world because phosphorus is again a problem. And this time it's not detergent. Yeah. Right. It's, it's basically agriculture runoff. Now, to, to, get, to get that connection, can we draw the line? Can we talk about um, fertilizer for a little bit, the agricultural sure. revolution and the the annoying enigma that is Fritz Haber? <laughs> annoying maybe ghastly I yeah <laughs> um, yeah so so the book really starts with the discovery of phosphorus as mm -hmm. an element, which happened in the 1600s and i kind of trace its use through the centuries to the point where you know it, it became a very potent weapon in, in vietnam they referred to it as willy pete white phosphorus mm -hmm. it, it's 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 an incendiary it burns everything that it touches um but it also has this miraculous fertilizing property. And as far as the nomenclature, it got confusing. So I decided to just go with, I'm going to call it all phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Even though when we're talking about detergent and we're talking about fertilizer, we are talking about phosphates, which phosphate. is mm -hmm. oxygen atoms surrounding a, a uh, phosphorus atom. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we began to realize, at first, I don't even think that it was people I know that they didn't know what it was about certain materials that made crops grow. They just knew it did. And, you know, ever since we started agriculture 10,000 years ago, it's been a struggle to keep fields fertile because mm -hmm. they'll naturally be depleted as crops are harvested and those crops are carted away. And, and along with it goes the phosphorus. So like, like a forest is self-sustaining because trees grow, die, decay, and it's the circle mm -hmm. of life, you know, made manifest by these phosphorus atoms. Um, so early on, we were using things like manure, blood, hair, mm -hmm. cloth, uh, and then bones, anything, anything people could think of to throw on a field. And it was all trial and error. And for some reason, bones worked very, very well. And England was a pioneer in this because this was going on in the 1700s, early 1800s. And the little ice age was still, you know, messing with crops and famine was ever, ever a threat. And so staying fed was, was like our job still is today. We're just a little removed from it. Um, so bones became a hot item and they were the original source for animals um, and particularly bone shavings from, from like knife factories where they mm -hmm. would make the handles out of bones and the shavings would be sprinkled. And it was like this miracle dust, but there's only so many knives and bone handles. So, uh, <laughs> Eventually, they got they being the British got more ambitious, and there's a section in the book. I was fortunate to be able to go over to to Waterloo before the yeah, was. but yeah. So, so in 1815, <laughs> like 40,000 soldiers fell in 10 hours on the battlefield of Waterloo in Belgium, along with a bunch of horses, and um, it, it just it was I forgot the number, but they were dropping like more than once a second, I think. Mm ghastly and um today if you go that there's a visitor center and there's you know this interpretive exhibits but um it isn't sacred ground uh it's farmed and i think a big reason is because it's there hasn't been any remains on that battlefield which isn't a lot bigger than a few golf courses strung together it's remarkably mm -hmm. small it's just the carnage is just unfathomable but um there, there aren't any bones there's no mass burial grave because not long after the war the british came back to you know reap their rewards of the battle i suppose <laughs> and uh indiscriminately they didn't just take uh napoleon's soldiers they took their own uh brought them back and ground them up in these specially built mm -hmm. uh, mills to make bone dust to spread on their turnips and their wheat and so that was kind of the dawn of of commercial fertilizer but mm -hmm. again and that's what the first part of this book about is about is just like the lengths we were going to to find new sources of phosphorus. So after we ran out of bones, um, you know, we needed something else. And that, that led, led us, us being whites and Western Europeans to, yes. to uh, the West coast of South America. Yes. And we're to the Guano Islands, yep. which are just mounds of bird poop. Um, I, before I started working on this, I thought that guano was just bat crap, but it's it's bird crap too. That's yeah, all and, of it. And yeah, and these islands are lousy with it because uh, 
There's a lot of fish swimming in that area. They're following the Humboldt current up the west coast of South mm -hmm. Africa or South mm -hmm. America. And those fish draw in birds and those birds need to nest and need to poop. And they were doing so on these islands for millennia, for eons, I mean, for forever. And um, it, it doesn't really rain there. So what would normally be washed off these islands, off the landscape and, and flushed into the sea, where it would provide nutrition for the aquatic world, it just kind of stored up there like a battery, a battery of nutrition, of fertilizer. And so, you know, I was saying it was like the 1820s, the British were big on bones. By the 1840s, they were moving toward this guano. And, and so was the rest of Europe and North America. And at the time, you know, I, I encountered some reporting and they were characterizing these these mountains of bird poop as inexhaustible mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and if it is exhaustible it's going to be hundreds of years and that's mm -hmm. the story of phosphorus it wasn't it was played out in a matter of 40 years or so yeah. so that set us on the hunt again and um and so today where we get our fertilizer our phosphorus so fertilizer is basically three critical elements mm -hmm. Uh, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll talk about nitrogen in a second. Uh, and th there is no imminent risk of running out of, of potassium, but phosphorus it was different. And so um, geologists got involved, chemists got involved, and, th and they, they eventually learned that certain rock formations, primarily sedimentary rock formations, which are really the accretion of so much dead life over millions of years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are are a remarkable source of, of phosphorus. And so that's what's keeping us alive today. That and nitrogen and potassium. And so nitrogen was a big problem in the 1800s as mm -hmm. well. And so the hunt was always on, on for that uh, until Fritz Haber uh, came up with uh, the Haber-Bosch process, which was basically a way to pull nitrogen out of the air. And the air, I, I can't remember, it's like 80% nitrogen. I mean, there's plenty of it. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just not in, typically in a usable form for most uh, plant life. Certain plants, legumes, can can snatch it from the air, but most couldn't. And Fritz, could, Fritz figured out how to do this, and that lifted the cap on, on, on the nitrogen side of things. So I talk a little bit in the book about the law of the minimum. And once, mm -hmm. we, once we solved the nitrogen problem and the potassium was never really a problem, it became exclusively a, a phosphorus problem. And so we've been you know, desperate for it ever since. And it's been remarkably successful. We have you know, probably eight times more people on earth than we did when we first started using this stuff. Yeah. But it's not, as, as we should have learned from, from the bird poop and the bones, <laughs> not inexhaustible. Yeah. And so, so these deposits of sedimentary rock are not common. And the biggest ones that we have in the U.S. are in Florida, but those are expected to play out in a matter of decades, three mm -hmm. or four, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. At which point there's some other reserves in, in the Carolinas and in Idaho, but they're not as extensive. It seems inevitable that we're going to be dependent on other countries mm -hmm. for our nutritional security, which is a lot more complicated, I would argue, than um, energy security, because there's workarounds for... Mm -hmm. Um, oil, but mm -hmm. but every living cell on the planet, maybe in the universe, <laughs> needs needs phosphorus. It's in every cell. Then, right. as Isaac Asimov said back in the fifties, you know, it's life's bottleneck. There's no yeah. substitute for it. So most of the reserves today, seventy to eighty percent of the and reserves are defined as areas that are known to have phosphorus-rich rock that mm -hmm. are able to be mined at, at an economic in an economic way. But as long, as long as we're effectively mining phosphorus, it's a limited resource. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. By definition of the mining of it. Yeah. Right. A, but so, so 70, 80% of it is in Western Sahara yep. and Morocco, mm -hmm. which, is, which is kind of a dicey place at the moment. Yep. And, um, and so there could come a time when, you know, these countries, these far flung countries are, are basically you know, they're the dispensers of fertilizer for the rest of the world. And that's kind of a dicey prospect. Right. When that'll happen is very controversial. And, you know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, an Australian researcher came out with a study saying it could be in less than a century. And mm -hmm. yeah. uh, people, people who know more about mining and, and the industry 
say, no, we've got 350. Yeah, they're poo-pooing that yeah. estimate. Yeah. So 350, 400 years is not, <laughs> it's not a long time. Not a long time. And yeah. so, so, and here's the paradox. While we're blowing through it at an unsustainable pace, we're also soiling or spoiling our waters. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and just excess that, too much, yeah. Algae, toxic algae. And so that's the cost of this this centuries-long hunt that we've been on for, you know, quick and easy food. Because the phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus <laughs> is essential for things to grow. And that includes things in the water where the phosphorus runs off and the algae live. Yes. yes. And, and so that's how we get to the algae problem and the cyanobacteria and yay cyanotoxins which seems to have evolved for some reason yeah yeah that's you know i was talking about the limiting factor earlier and and phosphorus is by most accounts in almost every case the limiting factor in in aquatic worlds so a lake like lake erie or a, you know a pond not far from my house in milwaukee uh, they're primed to explode with algae if they get too much fertilizer and they're getting too much fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the consequence of, you know, decades of putting more of this chemical concoction, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium uh, on, on the landscape, more than the landscape needed and mm -hmm. sort of washed off. But it's also um, manure. It's, it's a big problem due to manure because uh, I'll back up real quickly. We were, you know, talking about the Cuyahoga River and all the trouble back in the early 70s. That not only got us a new version of the Lorax, it got us the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. The Clean Water Act really throttled the industry's ability to just wantonly pollute. And so uh, in regulatory parlance, they talk about point sources, which are basically yeah. factories with pipes and smokestacks. Sure. And, and so, <laughs> you know, you've got the pollution... Uh, in a place where it can be treated or, or plugged. You can plug a pipe if you have to. Uh, agriculture was different, particularly in, in the early 1970s. It was known to be, you know, uh, a pollutant primarily because of all the phosphorus in it, mm -hmm. but in, in agriculture waste. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't considered a big enough problem to address. It was also considered too hard of a problem because it's a non-point source pollution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's cow patties on pastures, you know, yeah. and you can mm -hmm. a pipe, but you can't really squeegee a farm field. And so it was kind of done out of expedience back in the early 70s. But farming, agriculture has changed a lot since then. And the scale of the farms have gotten so big that you have literally, mm -hmm. you know, lagoons of manure right. that are constantly filling up and they need to be um, emptied. And, and, and too often they're emptied on, on landscapes that may or may not need that nutritional infusion. And then it ends up in the water. And that's why we have this toxic. Water. And so make that connection between the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and the dairy farm in Iowa. Yeah. And, and that one's a little, it, it, was, it was like, this sounds kind of cynical, but it was, I guess, fortunate timing for the book yeah. <laughs> when I was writing this because 2019 was like, maybe it was straddling 2018 or 2020. I can't remember, but there was 12 months that were the wettest period on record in the Mississippi River Basin. And that meant a lot of water going down the Mississippi, mm -hmm. and that meant a lot of nutrients in the water. And so... From runoff. Of, from runoff, from, yeah. from farms. And so a lot of people are familiar with the Gulf dead zone, and that's primarily a nitrogen-driven problem because it's salt water. Mm -hmm. So the chemistry of it all is just different. And phosphorus plays a role, but it's not the limiting factor. But things changed in 2019 because so much water went down the Mississippi that it basically, when it hit the Gulf, it turned the coast, particularly east of uh, New Orleans, fresh water. Mm -hmm. Fresh water, yeah. I can't remember what the numbers are. I think it's seawater is typically like 30 parts per thousand salt. And, and I talked to a guy in Alabama, which is, he was like 60 miles from where the Mississippi spills into the Gulf. And he was out on a boat 10 miles out. He took a salinity reading one day of five parts per thousand, mm -hmm. which, I mean, he couldn't believe it. He was sure when he was telling me this, it was like he was explaining watching somebody push open a casket and get up and walk. I, mean, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I remember he called it bonkers. And it wasn't, it wasn't just Alabama. It was the whole Mississippi coast that summer turned fresh water. Mm -hmm. But that water wasn't just water. It had a lot of phosphorus in it. Mm 
So for the first time, I guess significantly that I was able to determine, we had this toxic algae, blue-green algae outbreaks on the coast of uh, the Gulf of Mexico, in Mississippi in particular. And so that summer, I think the first beach closure, closure happened in the late June, and the beaches were closed for the whole summer. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've been to Mississippi in the summer, but you want to swim. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's muggy. And so I went down there and, you know, I was trying to just explain the connection. And that's what this book really is. It's just connecting dots to mm-hmm. the picture so people can understand what's going on and what the issues and, and opportunities are. But uh, in this case, it was it was showing how farms way up in the watershed, you know, way, way up, were polluting Mississippi beaches. That's right. And I like to tell, because of my journalist background, journalistic background, I, I do like to tell the, these stories as actual stories through people's experiences. And I encountered a guy down in Mississippi that summer who had bought a fleet of jet skis mm-hmm. expecting a banner year. And um, he couldn't rent them because yeah. the beaches were closed. So he was taking them up to Georgia to sell them because he had to pay the bank. Right. And he was saying, you know, why am I being regulated out of business when the source of the problem is largely unregulated? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a real good question. I thought it was a terrific answer to a mental question people would have. It's like, why do we need these, all these national regulations? They just get in the way of everything. But your answer was, how else are you going to deal with Iowa runoff producing dead zones in, in the Gulf? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I don't want to disparage or vilify agriculture. And, mm-hmm. You know, they're just uh, they're operating in the under the system that we've put in place. We've set up for them, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Time. You've Go put, uh, you know, I I reread this book as well. I read this, and then I reread this, <laughs> and in both of them, you got farmers going. You know, we're working with them, and why should we be the bad guys? And yeah, stuff and, like that. And, and there's a phenomenon yeah. too where farmers will acknowledge that there's a problem, but it's yes. not their but problem. They, they didn't do it. They're doing I'm things. I'm doing it. Right. You know, they're using less phosphorus than they had been, and they are, but they're, you know, this is a legacy problem. There's a lot of phosphorus unused built up in soils that are going to, it's going to be leaching out even if we stop this gusher. It used to be a trickle into the natural world, and we've turned it into a gusher. And we can't turn it off because we need to feed ourselves. But um, what we really need to do, if I do have one goal in this book, it's to to get people thinking again about the circle of life. Because mm-hmm. as I said earlier, with the forests, you know, things would die, decay, and, and open the door to the next generation. And once we started agriculture, where you grow something in one place and eat it in another and expel it in another place, that land is, is, is being stripped of its essential nutrients and it's going to have to be replenished. And so what's the answer? Well, it's undeniable that we're going to need to keep mining the fertilizer, the phosphorus rocks that we have. But we also have to stop looking at these manure lagoons that I was just talking about as piles of waste. Because Mm -hmm. like you think at the lengths that the British were going to in the 1800s, they would see a lagoon like that, not as like a, you know, a big tub of muck. (laughs) They'd see it as like, you know, food, which is Mm -hmm. what it is. And um, there's a lot of opportunities now to start treating this stuff, you know, as a, as a point source pollution and refining the nitrogen and the phosphorus in it, as well as stripping out the methane. I mean, there was a story in my hometown newspaper last summer about uh, anaerobic digesters on some of the bigger uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, factory farms up in northeastern Wisconsin, where they're stripping out the methane and because of some California subsidies, uh, it's it's pretty close to generating some of these operators as much money as their milk. Mm-hmm. Wow. So so the the manure is worth as the brown stuff's worth as much as the white stuff, and that's yeah. just in terms of energy, uh, not in terms of, of nutrients. And there are you know technologies where you can you can strip the, the phosphorus out of that stuff, and it'll be as pure as anything coming out of a, mm-hmm. a chemical factory. So that's one of my that's one of my aims with this book is to just get people thinking like we don't yes we can't use this once and chuck it in the water um and that's what we've been doing you know since the 1850s with the construction of sewers and (laughs) it was a great idea in the 1850s like in Mm -hmm. london and and paris there was so much you know cholera and typhoid that they didn't really have a choice but what makes sense in 1850 doesn't necessarily make sense in 2020 Mm -hmm. 
And so mm -hmm. we're living in 2020. I found where I'd written down from late in the book that you said there's uh, globally, there's about 3 million tons of phosphorus annually in human waste. And I, your point is, is we can't, can't neglect that. No, and we can't. And, you know, there's places where it's starting to happen. And so human waste is, is, is a, I don't know the percent, but of, uh, if, we, if we used it all, what percent that would meet our, our annual phosphorus demand. But I've seen some reporting where it's been estimated like 50% of our, of our fertilizer needs could be derived just from animal manure, 50%. And humans are going to be less, but it's also easier to treat the human stuff because of our sewers and our wastewater treatment plants. And so going back real quickly to talk about the string the, the, of this book, you know, when I started it, I didn't know I was going to, I was going to end up here, but I, <laughs> I started in, in Germany in 1669 mm -hmm. when the first alchemist cooked phosphorus, elemental phosphorus, the, the dangerous stuff mm -hmm. out of his urine. And, um, you know, that was just kind of the dawn of, of our, our relationship, our, our, un, our known relationship with phosphorus. And then in 1943, Hamburg got burned to the ground by Allied bombers dropping mm -hmm. incendiaries, many of them being phosphorus. phosphorus yeah. and, um, and so that's really where the book starts. It starts with so these bombs look a lot like fireworks, you know, just these glowing globules drifting down, trailed by a streak of smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is when, when these globules land, whether it's on a roof of a house or the head of a person, it burns all the way through. It burns just, I forgot the, the degree at which it's burning, but it's insanely hot. And so this was uh, utilized, this property was utilized by the Allies to, to burn Hamburg and some other cities to the ground. And this was illuminating <laughs> to me uh, that, you know, I thought in World War II, we were just trying to with conventional weapons trying to blow cities and people to smithereens but mm. it wasn't like that they were trying to burn cities down and they were working with architects german architects to find out like the layouts of the typical house and typical neighborhoods of hamburg and so they dropped big bombs to basically open up the windows blow out the roofs so so heat and other stuff could convect through a structure but then they drop all these little bombs some of them were only like you know two pounds just these little fires mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um They'd start, you know, the idea was you start a bunch of fires and they meet and they turn into a tornado firestorm. And that's exactly what happened. And so Hamburg today, you know, the, the stonework survived, but all the, most, a lot, not all, but much of the town burned down. But not all those bombs landed on their targets, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. All of them landed in water or the globules landed in water where they basically are, are stuck frozen in time. Because once phosphorus hits water, it stops burning and it becomes stable as a pebble. It looks like a pebble. And so it, all, it looks a lot like amber. And so in this region in Northern Germany, along the Elbe River and the uh, Baltic coast, people literally hunt for, for Baltic amber. It's like, a, it's like a Alaskan salmon. It's like a trademark, Baltic mm -hmm. amber. And, uh, and so there's signs on the beach now saying, hey, be careful what you're picking up because it may yeah. not be good. It may be phosphorus. And so I opened up the book with a guy who he thought he had a piece of fossilized oyster shell. And then he put it in his pocket and the stuff is stable. It just glows until it hits 80 degrees Fahrenheit or so. So he picked it from the cold Baltic Sea and it was, yeah, stable, stable as a rock. Put it in his pants pocket and mm -hmm. it just explodes. He had no idea what it was. And, uh, you know, they, they were going to call a helicopter, but he kept going into the water and this is winter kept going into the water because if he came out, it would flare up. And so they were going to bring a helicopter, but they, they didn't know what it was, what was going on. And they thought um, it may bring down the helicopter. So they finally mm -hmm. packed him in, in wet towels, I believe, and put him in an ambulance and mm -hmm. took him off to where the, the phosphorus was, what was left was removed. But he burned about a third of his body horribly. And this isn't doesn't happen every day, but you can do a Google search. It happens. And so, so Hamburg. It was discovered there. Hamburg was destroyed by it. And then today, Hamburg is really kind of the hope for the future because Germany's got very strict uh, phosphorus discharge laws coming online by the end of uh, the 2020s. And so the, the wastewater treatment plant at Hamburg, I forgot it serves two or three million people. Mm. Like that. 
it is, they've got a phosphorus recovery system on that that I visited when it was still just being constructed. They had a pilot project working, but there it's online now. And I should, it just came online at the end of last year. So just a matter of mm -hmm. months. And I think it's, I think it's coming along just fine. And it's taken all the phosphorus out of the water. Virtually you can never get to zero, but right. it pretty, you know, point zero zero. So this is a waste treatment place where they're waste treatment point. Place. Right. And so, so they're, they're, they're producing phosphorus from it. And that's phosphorus that they're going to use as fertilizer because mm -hmm. Europe, I was saying the U.S. is, is going to be soon running low in phosphorus. Europe's already there. They're dependent on other countries. So this is one way to get some semblance of uh, nutritional independence from other countries. Right. But it's also protecting the water. Mm -hmm. and so right. They see the circle, the circle of life, and they're trying right. to stitch it back because these sewers and, and our agriculture efforts – basically took that circle and cracked it and straightened it into a line where it runs from crop to algae yeah. in the water. Right. So um, I, I'd talk like a little bit about that algae. If you, yeah, you know. I was curious <laughs> about the algae and the toxins and how, I mean, it's great for the algae, but it's bad for life. I mean, the rest, yeah. not, and humans, I mean, the very beginning of your book was the, the, the guy running from the police yeah. and he yeah. ends up in a, swamp or lake or something well, and the policeman's like that's gonna mess you people up. are gonna say what's the problem with a little algae there's always yeah, been algae yeah, yeah well, i also true. want you to touch on guam because i'm always surprised uh -huh. when i see guam i lived on guam as okay. a middle schooler and high schooler and i'm like hey guam's in the book oh I know, that's not I noticed a good that, reason Joanne, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so you know this 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 Toxic algae, it's actually a cyanobacteria. It's not technically an algae. algae it's right, like a right. photosynthesizing bacteria known as blue-green algae or cyanobacteria or just toxic algae. And, you know, it's been around. And, on and Earth. it looks like this. That's Lake Erie. Yeah, that, that is, is Lake Erie. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to keep the glow, but. Yeah, yeah. you can see a little research vessel on yeah. the side by the S. Uh, yeah, if you fell yeah. in that water, you'd be in big trouble because it's not water. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Poisonous. And so, yeah, so we've had cyanobacteria pretty much since the emergence of life on Earth, right? Yeah, so it, what's it, the deal? It was it was really drove the great oxygenation mm -hmm. event. I mean, it kicked it kicked oxygen into the atmosphere, the, the explosion of this stuff billions of years ago, to the point that we have life as we know it today. But it's not all good. And you know, it releases toxins. And so it's growing now at you know, rates that aren't natural. And that's because of the human inputs of phosphorus into various freshwater bodies. And the consequences of exposure to this can be everything from just kind of bothersome to deadly. And uh, so the, the, one of the most common forms of this cyanobacteria is called microcystis. And it produces a toxin known as microcystin. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, it's a liver toxin. It causes uh, respiratory issues and GI issues. And so in the summer of, I think it was 2019 as well, I was in Florida and Florida's in a fix with this stuff because the center of the peninsula is so heavily agriculture right. that it's right. kicking off a lot of excess phosphorus that ends up in Lake Okeechobee. Mm -hmm. It's like this 30 mile wide round circular lake in the middle of the, in the middle of the state. It's really shallow. It's really flat. Um, it's really warm. It's often flat unless it's hurricane season. And so it incubates this toxic algae. And then when, when hurricane season comes, the lake is really a man-made lake because of the berms containing it. And mm -hmm. those berms have a history of failing. They killed thousands of people a century ago in, in two, two episodes where they collapsed and just drowned. I think it was 2,000 people at one point. And two years later, it was like about the same amount. Maybe, if, maybe more, maybe less. I can't remember. But the point is... This thing isn't stable. It wasn't then, and even today it isn't. So as the wet season is approaching, the Army Corps will release water from Lake Okeechobee, and it goes down canals and rivers to the Gulf Coast near Fort Myers, and down rivers and canals to the Atlantic Coast at Stewart, Florida, where their beaches in both places are just smothered in the gunk. And so I went to a town hall meeting at City Hall in Stewart, Florida, back in, I think it was 2019, and the people were were pissed they were i mean there was there was just outrage in the room and this wasn't a gathering of environmentalists these were you know boat owners homeowners politicians um it was it, it's just had a devastating effect it doesn't happen every summer but it happens often 
And so I talked to a guy who uh, he'd been eating nothing but Tums for three days and he, <laughs> he ran a, a, a chain of um, magazines and he had like a 6,000 square foot office building that I went by it to try to meet him and it just said we're closed because of the fumes. And so you don't have to swim in this stuff to be exposed to it. You can just breathe it in and it'll make you sick to the point that the local, I think it was a health network, maybe it was the health department was posting signs everywhere around Stewart saying, you know, um, this water isn't safe to swim in. And then, uh, well, that was, that, that was a health officials. The health network uh, started a policy of anybody coming into the emergency room with certain symptoms, primarily respiratory and gastrointestinal, to find out if they've been swimming. Now, this is, this is ranked as America's one of, one of America's top 10 beach towns. Right. right. And, you know, the product <clears throat> that they've built their economy on is, is going south. And, um, it's not, it's not an abstract environmental issue where you're worried about the habitat of some creature thousands of miles away. They're worried about their own habitat and their, their own selves, their own health. And so getting to Guam, one of the areas that made me feel a little squeamish when I was doing the reporting for the book was how far to take this, but there's been some research and there's been some correlation far from any causation established that people who live near these water bodies, that are infested with, with cyanobacteria. Particularly, there's a, there's a study that happened up in New Hampshire where an inordinate number of people living around this, this toxic or this algae polluted lake were coming down with ALS. Mm -hmm. So there is, there's a fear that it could long-term exposure. And like I said, you don't have to swim in it. Although if you do swim in it it's, or, or drink it, um, it'll kill a dog real quick. It was recently <laughs> killed elephants in Africa, and it, it killed dozens of humans down in Brazil when, when some of the toxin got into the water supply at a dialysis mm -hmm. center. So it's it's not just a, an aesthetic issue. It's right. it's serious toxin, and and one of the one of the worries right now is that um, it could be it could be increasing incidence. Could be one factor. An increased incidence of neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. And Guam figured into the book because there was a study done a while back about, uh, are they Guamanians? I can never remember. Mm -hmm. Guamanians are fine. The natives are called Chamorros. So. Well, and the Chamorros, yeah, were coming mm -hmm. down uh, with an ALS-like uh, affliction. And the theory at the time was it was because they were eating uh, fruit bats. Mm -hmm. the whole, and, and, and fruit bats were eating some kind of, I can't remember what they were eating, moss seed. or something. Yeah. yeah. That had, has this protein BMAA mm -hmm. that has been linked to, to some of these neurodegenerative diseases. And so BMAA was considered to be bad stuff. And now there's research along the Florida coast showing that a lot of uh, 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 sea life has high levels of BMAA. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a chapter or a section of a chapter <laughs> On this in the book and yes. I, you know i was i'm glad i'm glad we put it in and i think we appropriately caveated it because it yeah you sure that. did yeah but um but it's definitely something that should be on people's radars when they're thinking about mm -hmm. how severe this problem is or, or can be and it's getting worse i mean it's just maybe i think some of it is is there's a heightened sensitivity to it but there was a study done last year and i think the incidence of it being reported in media globally had gone up you know, it was over, our, I can't remember the percent, but it was huge. And, it, you know, a lot of it depends on what the years are like. If there's more rain, we're going to have more runoff, which is right. more prosperous in the lake. And with climate changing, we are having more rain and more intense, in many places, spring events. And so that really primes lakes, like Lake Erie. I'll just talk real quickly about mm -hmm. that. Sure. We're, you know, I was saying it's probably time to put that line back in the Lorax. Lake Erie mm -hmm. is ground zero because of the Western Basin is heavily, heavily farmed. And it's, mm. I, I'm not going to say most, but I think it's probably most of those acres. The, the land is so flat. It used to be a swamp and it was drained and it turned, mm. was turned into cornfields and, and soy crops. Um, but the land is so flat that there needed to be drainage systems installed. So they call them drain tiles, but they're basically pipes under, under farm fields that pull water from the surface and flush it downstream. And mm -hmm. in Western, Western uh, Ohio, that's Lake Erie. And so yeah. the Western Basin, just they, it's so bad that they now predict the annual bloom and they can span like 2,000 square miles of just this wow. 
that that stuff that you were showing in the uh, on the book. Yeah, it's a great, yeah, I mean, great find, image. Like these aerial photos where that just goes on forever and ever, and um, it's 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 not getting any better. And and as a matter of fact, it's gotten so bad already that in, I think it was 2014. Some of this stuff, the toxin from it, it's clear. If, with the toxin, can break away from the algae. Mm -hmm. bacteria and exist independently of it. It's colorless, odorless, and it made its way into Toledo's drinking water supply. So they, in the middle of the night, had a do not drink order go out. And by the next morning, grocery star stores as far away as Ann Arbor, which is like an hour away, were empty of bottled water. And this went on for days to the point where the National Guard was called in to bring in like baby formula. Mm -hmm. You know, you yeah. can't. You can't go very long without water or food, and right. uh, and yeah. So this is this is a city on the edge of the world's largest freshwater system, and it, at that point, it couldn't safely drink. The five hundred thousand residents of Toledo and environs could not, you know, trust what was coming out of their taps, right. and that's that's pretty that's pretty grim. That wasn't happening when the Cuyahoga River was on fire. The water yeah. could be mm -hmm. and consumed. So yeah, these are things that. I think people really need to start thinking about harder. And I don't, it's not, my book isn't a prescription. It's not saying, let's do this, mm -hmm. this, and that. Mm -hmm. I think I, I just want to paint the picture and connect, connect the dots to paint a picture or to sketch a picture yeah. of what's going on. Speaking of connecting dots, like there is a little segue from your previous book to this one. You had a bit about phosphorus because you're talking about yeah. Things affecting the Great Lakes. Um, I mean, the focus was a lot on invasive species, but pollution is definitely another thing. Mm -hmm. So, so was it why you're writing the other book, or that you go? I think this could make another. Yeah, it's exactly what happened. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> matter of fact, I thought because that the Great Lakes book is really you know the product of of more than a decade's worth of work covering right. the Great Lakes for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and. Um, when I was writing it, I kind of felt like I was rehabbing an old house because I was given free reign to use whatever I needed to for my newspaper for the book. So I can't say it was cutting and pasting at all, but I mean, I would move sections in and then try to make it fit um, with everything around it. But it, it did feel like I was constrained and I, like I'd see something in a section and I'd need to take it out. And then I'd realize, oh, that was there for a reason because two pages later, I haven't introduced this concept. So it was like carrying this... Uh, analogy to rehabbing the house it'd be like oh that was a load-bearing wall you just took <laughs> put it back and i thought boy would it be fun to design and build a house from scratch and then when i was reading about phosphorus and how this alchemist cooked it out of his urine when he was trying to find the philosopher's stone which mm -hmm. they believed back then could turn base metals into gold uh when i saw that he cooked it out of urine and then it was quickly weaponized i was like this is way more interesting than the great lakes <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I particularly, my, you know, I mentioned how I opened the book, but my grand scheme when I first conceived this idea was to start the book by cooking, making my own phosphorus. Make your own. <laughs> yeah. I was quickly uh, <laughs> disabused of any notion that that could be fun or uh, effective. It's really dangerous. And it's not even really possible to do on a small scale with the uh, lab gear that we have today. And I was going to try it with a turkey fryer. Yeah. <laughs> my... Uh, my partner and I would watch, some decades ago, would watch uh, naturalistic documentaries and things that always seemed to work their way around to how certain Aboriginal people lived in perfect harmony, harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. And we would always say, it's easy to live in perfect harmony with nature if there's only 12 of you. But if there's 12 <laughs> million of you, it's a lot harder. Yeah. And that all is demonstrated in here. And then I've been thinking, as I looked at this sweep of history, I started thinking, well, we had a, a century of discovery maybe or two. We had a century of exploitation. And now we seem to have a century of consequences. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. And everything's overexploited because the scale is so large. You start out with uh, an inexhaustible supply of bird poop and birds are going to keep pooping. And then you find out, no, you'll use it all up in 43 years. That just keeps popping up in the last time of all these things that we say, let's just mine it. It's inexhaustible, petroleum, whatever. And it seems not to be 
a question sort of is like, if you can summarize, but what are you going to tell people who read this and go, this is horrible, but how am I supposed to keep track of all of these horrid consequences that are happening and, and have any hope whatsoever? It's, yeah. a little bit, it's a little bit bewildering because they're all, they all seem like high priority demanding stories. I agree. I agree. Um, so a couple of answers to that. If it was a question, I'm not sure. Yeah, let's, go, <laughs> let's call it a question. First of all, you know, um, it's an entertain. I think it's an entertaining book, and even though it's a grim yes. stuff, that, oh yeah, and, you know, it, it, it's just kind of a, a dance through a lot of the science of the last two yes. years. Yes. And so I think it has utility in that, just for a reader experiencing. Mm -hmm. Of course, <laughs> that's my opinion. Well, it makes all these connections real and authentic. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it shows the interconnectedness of a lot of yeah. things. And here's one thing that the problem is connected to, and that's ethanol. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? Well, and again, I'm not going to say do this. I'm just going to say you should know about this, and you know, if you have an opinion, make it known. But 40 percent of the corn that we grow nationally ends up as ethanol, and ethanol has proven to be kind of an economic and an environmental wash, probably a yeah. loser. Yep. To everybody yeah. who isn't making money off of it and yeah. the people making money off of it love it and, yeah. and when i say it i'm not just talking about ethanol i'm talking about the ethanol mandate mm -hmm. that has been in place since the 1990s under uh, i think it was the second george bush mm -hmm. uh, where 10 percent of our fuel when you go to the gas pump you'll see the sign you know it's, it's, this is, it's 15 percent is ethanol and that stuff is it, it, it's not an economic or an environmental winner because it takes a lot of energy to produce mm -hmm. it to begin with. It takes a lot of land and puts it in production that would otherwise be performing some ecosystem services in terms of benefiting wildlife and whatnot. And um, it takes a lot of fertilizer too. And so uh, it's, despite all this, it remains remarkably politically popular. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that that's because of Iowa's place on the, for now, on For the now. presidential <laughs> primary calendar. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, you got, it's, it's at the top, the Iowa caucuses. Mm -hmm. So if you have presidential ambitions, you basically have to go to Iowa and pledge allegiance to ethanol. And Al Gore said as much. Mm -hmm. When he was running for president, he came out in support of ethanol, which he no longer does, as I understand it. And he said it was because he had a particular fondness for the farmers mm -hmm. of Iowa. And so that, to me, is, you know, some low-hanging fruit, if you will. Like, mm -hmm. It's something to like do, should we rethink this? Not just because of the inefficiency of the product, mm -hmm. but because of what it's doing, the consequences it's having on our fresh waters. And so that's, that's another thought that I have. But I think more broadly, it's that it goes back to the circle of life. And yeah. you know, this isn't just Lion King stuff. This is real. This is the way Earth worked. You know, the first phosphorus that made its way into the first cells trickled from igneous rock that was magma that cooled and it just, you know, celestially was blessed with the, this, this phosphorus. And so once that stuff broke loose into the living world, it cycled over and over again, just like a tree falling and decaying. It happened with cells, everything uh, on the cellular level, all the way through. It was reused over and over and over. And once we found mounds of it that took millions of years to concentrate in yeah. these certain areas, yeah. it never goes away, but what we're using it and diffusing it to the point where you can't just go grab more of it because it's just right. floating in terms of like in, in in the shape of toxic algae. It's just it's it's not con it's mm -hmm. not these batteries of fertilizer that we've inherited. So we need to think about we'll never be in complete phosphorus balance, but we need to think about how to get into greater phosphorus balance. Yeah. Right. The benefits will be two: one, we'll prolong the uh, rock reserves that we have, and two, the water won't be turning. Green and poison. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, There's the, clever engineers out there, clever people <laughs> who, who, you know, hopefully, you know, like in Germany, they get started before it's really too late. Yeah. Yes. The longer we go without addressing it, then the, the yeah. more of the challenges. And I think we can address it in a way that isn't going to put anybody out of business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, I ate breakfast this morning. I'm about to have lunch. I'm going to have dinner. And I'm going to do it all again tomorrow. I need <laughs> agriculture. As much as anybody but i also need fresh water mm -hmm. and and the two shouldn't be on a collision course and, and it appears in too many places right now they are 
I uh, sure. I made a note in my or I made a comment in my notes about tentacles, and it took me a while to figure out what that was. But if you were wondering if if you had a logical presentation that was entertaining, fun, and informative, the answer is yes. Uh, our conversation's been a bit scattershot, but the book reads very exactly. very smoothly and beautifully, and I particularly admired the way. Um, you pointed out these consequences and even their tentacles that reach out into other things along the way without losing the the thread of the story. I think that was that was nicely done and very helpful. Very good. Yes. Well, yeah, there's a reason why he's been on these Pulitzer Prize lists. So there you, yep. For sure. <laughs> so I, I truly enjoy reading your stuff. So that being said, do you have an idea for a future book? <laughs> This just you don't want to sit in your van that long? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did write a lot of this book in my van because of COVID and a house full of kids and a working wife and a barky dog. <laughs> um, no, the book just came out in March, and I, 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 have a, I have a couple of ideas. I may want to just start with maybe some magazine stories. Okay. But uh, I did a long story in the summer of 21. I took a little break from this, this phosphorus book and, and did a long piece on Chicago's unique vulnerability to climate change mm. due to its uh, situation on Lake Michigan and how Lake Michigan mm. is the, the level of Lake Michigan is going up and down like a yo-yo in recent yes. years. And so when you think about uh, the rise in coastal waters, you know, that's happening incrementally, slowly mm -hmm. and pre almost predictably and in one direction, it's creeping inland. Well, Chicago two years ago, was drowning in Lake Michigan. I mean, there's footage of, of homes just being bat battered and trashed by by Lake Michigan waves. And and then it's all driven by ice. Uh, if you don't have mm. a big ice cover, uh, the, lake's gonna, the lake's gonna be high. And if you have a big ice cover, the lake's, let me get this straight. If you don't have a big ice cover, the lake's gonna be low. Mm -hmm. If you have a big ice cover, the lake's gonna be high. Mm -hmm. And so when we get a heavy ice here, it only, like Lake Michigan went up six feet huh. in three, in three really years. High. Six feet, and then it, and then it, it's it's on its way dropping now. I don't know how far down it is from that near record high, but um, we need Lake Michigan where it's been historically, and Lake Michigan may have other ideas. And this is consequences for you know the ten million people in the Chicago area, and Milwaukee's got a million and a half people, and so that that drives just not navigation issues, property loss issues, yes. water supply, it's water treatment. Our whole treatment system is premised on the idea that. We would like gravity pull it out to, to okay. see, if you will. Well, what if the sea's higher than the pipes? Yeah. You know, and you got 8 million people pooping mm -hmm. into those pipes. Yeah, and you've got uh, the Army Corps of Engineers that may or may not do something. <laughs> yeah, so that's so an they, idea yeah. that's to, so. to expand on this a little bit. Oh, um, I would definitely be interested. <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah. Well, wonderful. Uh, do you have anything else you want to add before? No, uh, we I just appreciate the time and the interest. No, definitely, definitely. I think any book you put out, uh, I'm going to read it. And oh, yeah. one quick thing, uh, uh, someone who's been on our program twice, Cynthia Barnett, an mm -hmm. environmental journalist, did say to ask you about the bone spikes, but I think you maybe covered that, fertilizer bone spikes. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> some of the early efforts. Right. It was kind of like miracle grow sticks. They were just yep. shards of bone in the ground. That's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Anyway, so I was glad she she popped in and left a comment uh, in our promotion <laughs> time to, to ask nice. you, but yeah. So. And it's an unlimited resource. Yeah. Never yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how many people agree to that these days. <laughs> okay. Well, Dan, thank you so much. And uh, for those of you watching, we've been talking about Dan's latest book, The Devil's Element, Phosphorus in a World Out of Balance. And, uh, and also just because uh, this book is also great, his first book, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. So I definitely highly recommend that to anybody who's interested. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, Dan. Good luck with everything. Thanks a lot. Great talking to you guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right. Okay. There we go.